Dade County's strict construction code. Uh, maybe we can take a look around the corner, but um, these tie beams essentially were never anchored to the concrete slab anywhere around here. So they're just basically sitting on top of this concrete block wall here. These uh, hurricane straps, they call these, uh, these kind of rusted steel straps you see going up over the, the uh, wood frame structure. First of all, they're kind of tucked into the joint of the structure, whereas they should go over a flat piece of the, the wood, wood frame material. You can see where they're pulling loose. This, this actually was trying to pull loose from the, from the tie beam here. You might think, you know, they're just details, but all these details add up to catastrophe, really. The details added up to a $20 billion catastrophe in South Florida and personal tragedies for which there are no price tags. We can never know for certain what we can count on until a disaster hits. On Dade County's strict building code to ensure a home safety. On a train from Miami to evacuate the veterans in 1935. On an early warning to give us time to escape the storm. A catastrophe like a major hurricane can knock out all our life support systems. It's the ultimate test of our ability to be prepared. The people of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, have been devastated by floods three times in the last century. Each time they thought they were prepared. Each time, the lesson was bitter. On May 31st, 1889, a huge earthen dam gave way above Johnstown, Pennsylvania. 2,200 people died. Many of them were laid to rest here in Grandview Cemetery. Entire families were wiped out. Hundreds of the dead were never identified. They lie in these unmarked graves. The city was devastated in less than 10 minutes. As you approach Johnstown from the north, it's easy to see its vulnerability. The mountains form huge aqueducts that funnel the Little Connemaw, the Stony Creek River, and the Connemaw directly through the city. Johnstown's history rests along its rivers. The great Cambria Ironworks, built around 1850, still stands along the banks of the Connemaw. The stone bridge built over a hundred years ago by the Pennsylvania Railroad, a kind of memorial to the people who died here in 1889. Everywhere you go in Johnstown, there are reminders of the Great Flood. Well, Johnstown in the 1880s was a wide open, booming steel town. It was one of the nation's centers in the emerging modern steel industry, and the town was expanding at an unbelievable rate. Population was doubling every 10 years as waves of immigrants poured into Johnstown to get jobs in the mills and mines of the Cambria Iron Company. Johnstown, of course, is a flood-prone community, but what they'd done in the 1870s and 1880s is essentially cut the rivers in half. They would take slag from the iron furnaces, pour it into the rivers, and then build on it so they'd made land at the expense of the rivers and as the rivers were narrowed, the frequency of flooding increased. The South Fork Dam lay 14 miles above Johnstown on the Little Connemaw. It was owned by the exclusive South Fork Hunting and Fishing Club. Its members, men like Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick, built boat docks, the clubhouse, and what they called summer cottages along the lake's edge. In Johnstown, it was known as the Bosses Club. This is what's left of the dam today. The club had rebuilt it in 1880, but without any qualified engineer to supervise, they botched the job. The lake behind it was 65 feet deep, three miles long, and a mile wide. Memorial Day, 1889. It rained heavily the night before. By morning, eight inches had fallen at the South Fork Dam, and the rain was still pouring. The water in the reservoir was only two feet below the top of the dam, rising at about an inch every 10 minutes. 
14 miles below, Johnstown was already flooding. At 3.15 that afternoon, 20 million tons of water pushed through the dam. In less than an hour, it wiped out a half dozen small towns, a 75-foot railroad bridge, two dozen locomotives, the huge Gautier wire mill, and at 4.10 in the afternoon, it hit Johnstown. That is when my mother took me in her arms and said, Carrie, we're going to die. She rushed the six of us up to the attic, and in the flash of a second, we felt the flow of water over us, and we landed quickly at the Stone Bridge. The Stone Bridge was at the west side of town. 14 miles of victims and survivors, horses and cattle, locomotives, factories, trees, and houses piled against the arches. My mother and father being pinned in, the men had to work quickly to get them out. My brother was never taken out. They thought he was crushed. And we're hoping that he lies among the unknown dead in this cemetery. Officially, 2,207 deaths were documented. Witnesses at the time said the death toll was much higher. They rebuilt Johnstown on that same floodplain. And by the turn of the century, the city was back, and some say better than ever. The snow was still melting in the mountains on St. Patrick's Day of 1936. A heavy rainstorm added to the runoff, and Johnstown was once more a disaster area. The flood in 1936 killed 25 people, and property damage was four times the 1889 flood. 15,000 Johnstowners wrote President Roosevelt demanding help to prevent any more floods in Johnstown. He responded generously with a $7 million flood control project. When it was finished, the Corps of Engineers announced, we believe that the flood troubles of Johnstown are at an end. We salute the flood-free city of Johnstown. The statement stood for 41 years. channel's Ray Ban was a weather forecaster in the Johnstown area in the mid-1970s. The 77 flood was a pure flash flood. It had its origins solely in the intense amount of rain that fell over an extremely short period of time over a very limited drainage basin, the uh, Connemaw River Basin itself, very narrow, and because of the mountainous terrain, that rain ran off extremely rapidly and caused the flood. The failure of another earthen dam caused most of the deaths. 77 people were killed, eight more missing. Property damage estimates, 300 million. The Corps of Engineers would never again declare a city flood-free. Well, I think the lesson here uh, among many is you can always depend on nature to do its worst. That man can mitigate disaster, he can prepare for disaster, but there's no way that you can make some communities totally free from floods or, or whatever natural disasters that they're prone to. So I think Johnstown, after the 1977 flood, is a much safer place to live in. Uh, uh, but this whole goal of totally eliminating the threat, uh, you know, the worst that nature can deal, it's, it's, it's impossible. Some disasters are predicted days in advance. Everyone knows they're coming, and still we're surprised. The Superstorm of 93, next.
system that struck 26 states, dumped enough snow to fill the Mississippi River for 40 days, and touched the lives of 50% of the people of the United States. Few of us experienced the true depths of disaster, but most of us got a hint of the overwhelming power of nature. All the way from Florida through Maine, the intensity of this storm had been indicated well in advance, several days in advance, for example. We started to talk to the emergency managers at the federal level on Tuesday and warning them of the intensity of the storm that was going to happen uh, over the weekend. But over 230 people lost their lives, the most in any single weather disaster in the U.S. in nearly 20 years. What seemed to be lacking was understanding. Many of us, especially in the South, experienced something we knew little about, the icy lash of a blizzard. Several people were killed in Florida by tornadoes spawned by the storm system and by a storm surge on the west coast of Florida that surprised everyone. The rest of the country, most of the deaths were due either to exertion or exposure. And we saw many individual cases of people having heart attacks from shoveling snow. This was a very heavy, wet snow in many areas. Or we saw people leaving their cars, getting caught out, uh, being really unaware of the intensity of the cold and of the wind accompanying these blizzard conditions. For most of us, the life-threatening paralysis of a blizzard came as a surprise. When you go for a drive, you know that something may go wrong, so you have a spare tire. You count on the police coming by if you have problems. You think that somebody in your family will come to look for you if you haven't arrived in, in time. And this storm was so great that it took out all of these safety nets at, at, at once, what we call technically at a common mode failure one common cause that took out many of the things that you counted on. From March 11th to the 14th in 1888, a blizzard very similar to the 93 storm pounded in New York and New England. 400 people died, 200 of them in New York City. As in 1993, it was a common mode failure, the failure of those technological safety nets which caused most of the deaths. New Yorkers counted on the new elevated trains to get them to work, on food delivered from out of town to live on. Mary Cable is the author of a book on the blizzard of 88. She lives and writes in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, the elevated had been going only a few years. And that really revolutionized. People could live in the Bronx or Brooklyn and get to work. I mean, they could commute. It was the beginning of commuting. The New Englanders just did as their fathers, grandfathers, and way back had been doing. They stayed in their houses. They had food in the cellar. And the New Yorkers had this thing about getting to work no matter what. And if their transportation wasn't available, they would walk miles, like 10 miles. There was one man who got stuck on a train as it was headed into Manhattan. And there was a long line of stuck trains ahead of his train. So he walked and crawled along the top of the train to get to Grand Central. And he did. But would New Yorkers have been better off not counting on the new transportation modes? You mean in the blizzard, would they have been better off? Oh, yes. But of course, they might not have had a job at all because um, it would have been a small town. New York grew in the 1880s thanks to the modern modes of transportation. Then during the blizzard, New Yorkers were surprised when these modern wonders failed. 